Hi all, welcome to the dermatology lecture, first lecture this spring. Um, just as an introduction, uh, I'm not going to spend a ton of time on derm. I think there's a, a lot more in your clinical med course that's probably more relevant to your practice. As far as drugs go, there's a little bit to be said. We'll talk about steroid um, potency, talk about drug delivery methods uh, and formulations, and that's about it. We'll touch on a little bit of other things too, like psoriasis and acne as well. So when it comes to getting drugs on delivering drugs topically, I should say, you have a couple different options, and really it depends on how much you really, or how deep penetration you want to get that drug into the different layers of the skin. Um, the idea is with a topical drug that you really don't get a lot of systemic absorption in most cases. Now, some cases you actually want to use a topical drug to get into systemic circulation. For example, like if you apply a patch, or there are some creams and gels that are designed to, to work that way where they absorb into the bloodstream over time. However, for the most part, what we're going to be talking about today are, are medications that don't work that way, that we want to stay pretty much within the epider excuse me, epidermis and dermis layer. We don't want it to get all the way into the bloodstream. And if we're doing that, um, that's probably going to put the patient at risk for side effects. So we're going to talk about some ways to avoid that and some drugs that might be more likely to cause those types of side effects, specifically when it comes to corticosteroids and their potencies. So generally speaking, you can look at the delivery of the vehicle and how far it's going to penetrate into the skin layers. Uh, and basically a lotion is going to penetrate the least far, cream is going to penetrate a little bit more, it's a little bit thicker, a little bit more uh, lipid soluble, and an ointment being um, the most lipid soluble and it's going to penetrate, or most lipophilic I should say, is going to penetrate uh, the most into the different layers of the skin. Um, and then gels are a little bit of a mixed bag. Some of them can be formulated to penetrate quite deeply, other ones can be formulated not to, it just depends. So they can kind of run the whole spectrum depending on how the drug company has penetrated uh, the gel. And basically with highest water content, you're going to be looking at um, more shallow penetration. So like a lotion being higher water content, ointment almost having no water in it whatsoever. I work with a, a physician um, named Dave Peterson, and he's got this dermatology wisdom thing that he always says. It says, if it's wet, make it dry. If it's dry, make it wet. Start with steroids. If that doesn't work, try an antifungal. <laughs> and I like this quote because I think it's a good way to remember pretty much the basics of like a, a topical dermatitis of sorts. Um, if you see somebody with something that you can't recognize. And for most of us, you know, especially me, I shouldn't really include me in this at all since I don't really know much about um, identifying dermatologic issues at all. Um, other than the weird things my, my son gets that I have to Google and try and figure out what it is. Um, what I would say is that you have, uh, depending on what you've studied, you might have a limited scope of what something is. Um, and sometimes it can be very difficult to differentiate, at least from my discussions with providers, it can be very difficult in like a primary care type setting, like a clinic, urgent care, et cetera, that you're going to have um, not necessarily the, the most uh, uh, time or per se the, the the resources or the the experience really to, to identify something very specifically uh, so you might have to kind of wing it in some cases and try a strategy like this so and not to say this is an absolute way to approach medicine at all it's just kind of a funny way to, to look at dermatology i think all right so let's start with corticosteroids because these really apply to a ton of different conditions and uh, are going to be probably the most common things that are prescription based um, topical products so what they do is we already talked about corticosteroids last fall but just a little reminder they are anti-inflammatory in nature um, they also have uh, when applied to the skin they have this anti-myotic activity which um, works great for scaling dermatoses so things that like build up plaques like for example psoriasis uh, plaques you can use uh, steroids for otherwise just really like kind of um, unusual dermatitis that might have um, sort of a, a sloughing of the skin it might help to thin that out a little bit however if you use it over time you can actually thin out the rest of the skin too just like corticosteroids um, when taken orally over time cause that as well the topical ones definitely could cause that effect locally um, they also have some uh, vasoconstrictive properties, so they can decrease the inflammation um, to a specific area, and therefore they can decrease um, some of the effects that are caused by the inflammation, like pruritus, um, and some of the burning and pain sensation associated with that. <clears throat> there are a lot of different products, and I'm going to kind of guide you through these in a minute here. Um, and within the products, you might have different strengths, different um, salt formulations, and different uh, vehicles. So you might have ointments versus creams versus a gel preparation. 
there's a lot of indications again so you can use these drugs anywhere from mild itching like um, over-the-counter hydrocortisone cream that you can buy um, just for like a, a you know a mosquito bite or um, severe psoriasis we can use some much more high potency ones for a more severe medical condition and I just put this last bullet point here as a guide about absorption. You have um, high absorption areas. So think about skin thickness basically is all we're talking about here. So areas that were with mostly that have pretty thin skin is going to be facial skin and skin around the genitals. And uh, that's going to have really high absorption. So keep that in mind when you're prescribing something. If you're going to put it on somebody's face, you want to make sure that you aren't giving something that's going to be really, really potent like for a steroid because... Um, the more potent the steroid, the thinner the skin, the higher likelihood that that drug is actually going to penetrate into the the, um, the deep areas that have blood vessels, and that can lead to systemic exposure, which can lead to unintended um, systemic side effects of steroids. One of the nice things about using steroids topically is that you generally avoid any type of systemic side effects. We talked about steroids having kind of a whole slew of nasty side effects, especially when taken chronically. <clears throat> so if you think about somebody with psoriasis that's maybe applying a steroid every day, it really does make the potency of the steroid, the vehicle, the delivery really important because you don't necessarily want to have that person overusing or, or applying that in an area that is uh, that's, that's really thin skin now for the most part. People don't have psoriasis on their face or genitals that I know of, uh, but it, it's still the principle still applies. You can have different areas with different thickening of skin. So like, for example, the palms of the hand and soles of the feet are going to have much thicker skin on them. Um, so it's going to be very difficult to get anything to absorb through that um, layer. You can treat those areas topically with really high potency steroids with probably minimal risk. Um, and, uh, you know, if you do want a bit of a deeper penetration, like in that, those areas of thick skin, soaking in warm water can, can work to, to, um, to allow those vehicles to, to get deeper into the skin as well. Um, just to review our corticosteroid mechanism a little bit, uh, remember that um, our cells are designed to work with corticosteroids and uh, they create this anti-inflammatory, anti-immune response. And you have um, corticosteroids that move through the cell membrane, they're lipophilic, they can move through um, very easily, and they, they interact with the receptor complex, which causes a downstream effect, um, which eventually um, decreases the ability of T cells to activate, uh, causing um, cytokine production and stuff like that. So there's a number of ways that they can work. This is just one of them, but it does decrease the inflammation in this process. All right, so this chart, I, I want you to memorize every single thing on here, and that's a joke, so hopefully you can get a good laugh when you're watching this. But the, the point with this is, and I'm going to point out a couple things that I do want you to know. Um, so let's talk about the, the range here. So this is a general classes of corticosteroids, topical, and how they apply as potency. So we talked about potency a little bit when it came to systemic use, so like drugs like prednisone and dexamethasone. Um, it's a lot simpler because there aren't as many agents. When it comes to topical use, there's tons. And you can see there's some similar things, so like hydrocortisone, um, uh, beta-methasone, for example, is a, is a whole agent. But there's a lot of them that we haven't talked about. Some of them uh, might sound familiar, like fluticasone and mometasone from the um, inhaled corticosteroid lecture um, from the, the asthma and COPD treatments. And that's because they are the same drug. Again, they're just formulated differently and they're put in a different vehicle. So really we're talking about the same stuff here for the most part. There's some new drugs on here. Um, but basically, these all work the same way. It's just a matter of how much is in it, how potent of a steroid it is, and what type of vehicle it's in. So for example, let's see if we can pull one out. You can look at like a mid-potency beta-methasone, 0.12%. Um, and that's a foam. So a foam would be kind of a weird thing that probably wouldn't absorb all that much. You're really just looking at maybe a topical effect with that. Now, if we go all the way up to class one, the highest potency ones, you're looking at beta-methasone again, but it's a different salt. So it's dipropionate versus valerate, and it comes in a gel and an ointment. So it's a different delivery mechanism. And even if you look at this, this is a very small percentage of actual drug, but because of the vehicle it's in, because of the salt formulation, it allows it to penetrate and be quite potent. So so what do I want you to know about this? Um, so for um, for steroids, I think there's a couple of things to remember, and that's um, some high potency ones. So I want you to know a couple of the high potency ones. So this these four up here would be good to know: um, beta methasone, clobetazole, uh, 
and I don't I wouldn't worry about difluorosone. I don't think that's a US product. I, I'm not familiar with it. Halobetazole may be used, but these first two definitely I would remember betamethasone and clobetazole as the two kind of high potency ones you can think of. Keep those in your in your back pocket for if you want a high potency steroid to prescribe one of your patients, those are ones that should come to mind immediately. Um the rest of the classes get a little muddied, so I'm not going to spend a ton of time on them. I'm not going to ask you like, oh, let's use a, you want to use a class three high potency. Let's pick one of those. I'm not going to ask you that. We're basically going to ask you for high potency, mid potency, or low potency. And so we're going to skip some of the stuff in the middle. Now, if you want to learn this on your own or use this as a reference when you're on rotation or whatever, great. Uh, but for my test purposes, I just don't think it's worth the time to, to memorize all this. And hopefully you agree with me on that. So we're going through this. Um, Mid-potency, I always like triamcinolone. Triamcinolone is a really popular steroid option. And it's one that I think a lot of people like because it has a decent range of potency. Like you can see triamcinolone, uh, for example, ointment, uh, it can go up into class three. And then um, class four, you have a cream. Um, so you can have a bit of a variance depending on what type of vehicle you're giving it. So that's nice if you prescribe somebody a cream and, you know, it's like it's not really doing it. Maybe you want to up it to an ointment. Maybe the patient's okay with ointments. You know, ointments have their own issues as well. I, I don't know if I mentioned this anywhere else, but an ointment, of course, is greasy. And uh, depending on where the person's applying it, that might not be a big deal. But getting it on their clothes, getting it on... Um, other things they come in contact with. Let's say they have psoriasis on their elbows and then they get into their car and then they get cream, you know, summer and they get like, you know, ointment all over their armrests. You can think of scenarios like this, um, but it, it's just not convenient. Creams absorb, they, they get in. The problem with creams, of course, is that they just, they, they don't tend to stay in place as much. They tend to um, not last as long as an ointment. Not only does it penetrate the skin quite well, it also provides a bit of a barrier effect and uh, the drug stays in place longer. Now you can definitely put ointments on and then cover them up with some sort of a dressing. Again, that's a lot more work for patients. So it's a, a lot of this is gonna be, come down to compliance. Prescribe somebody an ointment, what are the odds they're actually going to use it? I mean, you got to think about that when you're when you're thinking about prescribing these medications. Um, now, maybe they've had experience with them before and they're fine. Ointments do absorb eventually, especially if you provide a thin layer. But you can easily see how somebody could end up with uh, ruined clothing or whatever that's going to make them say, I'm never going to take this medication again. But um, so now that we s took that little side tangent, um, Try and Cinnolone again, it should be one you remember is a good mid potency. It's a prescription product. You can't get it over the counter. There's are a couple different formulations of Try and I'm trying to see if they're actually on here. Um, sorry. I don't see Try and Valorate, which is a bit of a different formulation. Um, it's a lower potency formulation that I, the, uh, sorry, a lower percentage formulation that again is salt. It's a different salt that allows it to dissociate and penetrate skin layers differently than the standard like triamcinolone cream and i believe that moves it up into potency a little bit more but again i don't see that on here so it's kind of ignore i said that but again just think about triamcinolone there's a standard triamcinolone cream that uh that is a really really popular one it, again mid potency you want something so this is a drug that you want that's a little bit higher potency than like uh over-the-counter hydrocortisone um and it's going to possibly provide a bit better response that way so that's a good one to remember. Uh, and then, of course, the low potency ones. And this one really, um, you think about these as your over-the-counter drugs. This is like hydrocortisone. A lot of these other low potency ones you can see are really just delivery methods. So creams and lotions, um, solutions. These are going to be high water content items that, while they could work really great locally, for they're going to be pretty low potency just because they don't really do much other than just get to the top layer of the skin. Hydrocortisone is one to remember just because so many patients use this as a because it's available over the counter. So it might be the first thing they try. And the question is, does it actually do anything or not? Well, you know, that's debatable. I think um, there's some schools of thought that say it's basically a placebo effect. I don't think the clinical evidence for it is all that great. Uh, however, you know, maybe it's placebo for me, but if I get like a mosquito bite in the summer, I'll put a little bit of over-the-counter hydrocortisone on it. I do think it relieves the itching quite quickly. Maybe it's all in my head. I don't know. Or maybe it's just the cooling sensation of the cream. Who knows? 
Um, but <clears throat> anyway, patients are going to use this regardless of whether, you know, it's, it's appropriate or not. So it might be something that somebody comes in and says, hey, I've got this weird rash. I've been trying over-the-counter hydrocortisone. What's my next step? Or maybe they haven't tried anything. And you're like, well, let's try over-the-counter hydrocortisone. It's really pretty benign. Ultimately, worst case scenario, you're putting some cream on the person if you don't believe the drug is going to do all that much. And uh, at the end of the day, that's not going to hurt somebody. So um, just to review what I'm looking for here, low-potency hydrocortisone products, um, mid-potency triamcinolone, high-potency clobetazole, and betamethasone. So if you know those five, should be pretty good for the exam. I'm not going to test you on uh, a lot of other things. I will ask you some questions on um, formulation. So I'll ask you if like an ointment, lotion, cream, which one would be more likely to penetrate skin better, which is going to be higher water content, maybe a compliance, patient compliance related question versus like ointments and creams. So just keep some of those things in mind. I think it's all pretty, um, I think it's pretty common sense type stuff, but um, you know, just keep that in mind for, for the exam purposes that I might ask you like a question of a cream versus an ointment. Okay, so I've talked about a lot of this already on that last slide, but it, you know, here it is on a couple different uh, other slides too, and we'll, we'll go through this again just because I think it's important. These are, again, really popular drugs, so some re repetition isn't all that bad. So again, our super high potency clobetazole betamethasone. Um, so where are you going to actually use a super high potency? So these are going to be really severe dermatoses, and really uh, you aren't ever going to use high potency on facial or genital skin regardless of how severe it is. Now, some people, a dermatologist might argue with me on that, and I have no problem with that. And maybe there's there's some indications where that might actually be appropriate. But for the most part, from what I've read, it's just too high potent for those areas of thin skin. Not only can it thin out the skin to the point where you could get um, some more irritation, you can also get a, the systemic absorption, which is going to cause uh, side effects potentially. Uh, medium high, of course, you're just going to look at your risk of the patient and how and how severe the dermatosis is. And then low, you're looking at um, larger areas of the bodies that need to be treated. So uh, the other thing that I haven't really mentioned yet is is uh, surface area of skin. So how much skin are you actually applying the product to? If you're applying it to like your entire trunk, that's a lot of surface area. So you're you're at much higher risk for getting systemic absorption, systemic side effects. If you're applying it in a small localized area. It's, it's totally different ballgame. So that's what you have to take into consideration, too, when you're thinking about prescribing somebody high potency versus low potency. You want to make sure that um, you're minimizing your patient's risk for systemic exposure to the drug. And uh, in that case, if you're looking at really large areas, you might want to decrease your potency somewhat or um, try a, a less high penetrating formulation like generally speaking if you have a really high area like an entire trunk rash or something that you're applying steroids to probably aren't going to have somebody covering their whole body in ointment you're probably going to use a cream or a lotion that's a little bit easier to spread absorbs a lot better so you know there's again some common sense here but at the same time just something to remember is surface area does play into effect when it comes to um, watching out for those systemic side effects for our patients uh, very low potency, genitals, eyelids, facial skin, you're going to look at starting low. You can go up a little bit if you need to, but for the most part, you're going to keep that potency quite low with uh, those skin areas. Um, and then you can, again, consider going up to medium potency. And yeah, again, some dermatologists might say, well, you can go high potency in certain situations. And I'm not saying you can't. I'm just saying, like, generally speaking, you know, if you're going to consider prescribing a really high potency steroid for somebody to use on their skin, in the facial genital region, that might be a sign that you might need to refer them to a dermatologist if that's not a uh, you know a, a specialty you're all that comfortable with. A couple other things to think about would be duration of use of the agents. So if you're looking at a daily use product uh, and you're prescribing somebody a super high potency one, I would recommend no more than three weeks. And again, this could really depend on what's going on with the patient. You might require longer treatment. Potentially, and if it's a small area, uh, it's probably fine. But <clears throat> you're just the longer you use it, the higher the risk of systemic exposure to. And again, that's what we're trying to avoid. Um, high to medium, usually you're looking at a six to eight week duration uh, max. And then low potency, there's pretty minimal risk, so you could really use this almost indefinitely, um, just in case they're using it with a large area of skin. Um, that would be maybe a concern. But for the most part, you can use these. And there's there's very minimal risk at all, especially if it's like a cream of getting any systemic exposure whatsoever. Um, I would still, you know, not recommend a patient use these for no reason. But if they do have a good reason and they're getting a good response from a low potency corticosteroid, there might be, a, you know, a good reason for them to use these fairly regularly. 
Um, intermittent therapy is another thing that can be do, done. So like um, you could try a corticosteroid holiday of sorts, try giving a high potency one for a couple of weeks and then go to something a little bit, um, then stop it for maybe a week and restart it, give the skin a chance to heal itself up so it doesn't thin out too much. Um, and uh, and see you know how how your progress is going with the with the therapy. For children, children have generally uh, higher risk for exposure to um, systemic side effects from these types of drugs. So you usually stick with pretty low potency, like class four or below, um, and in short durations. If you had a really severe case, you could consider a high potency one, but it's going to require um, some special judgment calls, I think. And usually the dose we're looking at two fifths to two third of the adult dose. And what that means is as far as like percentages and potency and, and how much you're applying. So you want to make sure that the parent or, you know, if it's an older child who's going to be applying it themselves, maybe somebody in like, you know, 12 to, to 15 or something like that, um, that they understand how much to use, not to use a lot. And um, you're making sure that if you have, if you're thinking about a product to prescribe, maybe you go with a slightly lower percentage uh, product as opposed to uh, a higher percentage product. With pregnancy and lactation, um, question is, can, can pregnant people use this and what's the, and lactating women use this and what's the side effect or, or issues around, um, around possible systemic absorption? For the most part, corticosteroids are not significantly high risk for pregnancy and lactation. And um, generally, the indications we use them for when we're looking at like systemic use are usually short term. Um, as far as long term use goes, it really depends on the situation. It's a benefits out risk scenario. In most cases, there are some case reports that show that corticosteroids can cause some birth defects, but they're very, um, very small numbers. And uh, the evidence isn't real clear. I don't think it's a lot of like case report type stuff as opposed to, you know, big, um, large pools of evidence that support uh, not using corticosteroids in pregnancy. So again, it's a benefit out risk scenario. And you just use your common sense. If you're using a low potency corticosteroid, uh, you know, if, if you would think that the general person would have minimal risk for systemic absorption, it's fine to use in a pregnant person. If you're using high potency for long periods of time or mid potency over large areas of the body, that's where you might get concerned. Um, and you might want to just look into the literature. And that's where you just really need to have a conversation with your patient. Say, look, this has somewhat of a risk for systemic absorption. You know, there was a, sign, a, a study that showed that there's a birth defect in a patient who took oral corticosteroids. Question is, is this something you're comfortable with? Um, and the person might say, yeah, I think that's a low risk. I'm comfortable with that. Or they may say, no, um, let's try something else. And that's just, again, something you're going to have to talk about with your patients. As far as breastfeeding goes, I really don't think there's all that much risk whatsoever. But uh, again, high potency uh, or high to mid potency, large, large, body areas, surface areas over a prolonged period of time, you might want to consider, again, looking into the literature on it and discussing it with your patient because there's really not, we'll talk about lactation and meds in a little bit uh, when we talk about OB stuff, but um, generally speaking, the, the rule of thumb is that there's not a lot of evidence out there and um, it's difficult to really say how much of an effect it's going to have on the child. So it's, it's a bit of a nebulous thing and it's sometimes just really, again, a conversation, an open conversation with your patient about that, that there is some risk out there. It's probably minimal, but I, I do want to make you aware of it. And then they can decide for themselves you know, if it, the benefit of the perceived drug is worth it for them. All right, side effects. We talked about all these pretty much already. Safer than oral. You still get the skin atrophy. Um, allergic reactions can be uh, seen, it's usually related to the vehicle, not the actual drug. So if somebody gets an allergic reaction, try switching the actual vehicle to like an ointment or if it's a cream or, you know, whatever, or maybe a brand name, you know, if they're on one generic brand of a product, maybe see if the pharmacy has a different brand name of it, that could be enough to actually change it. Cause those vehicles will vary depending on what product or what company is producing the product. Um, Sometimes you have, if you have a fungal infection, like a tinea infection, you can end up with a worsening of the condition because it's actually suppressing the immune system locally. So your body can't fight the infection on its own. And that's where sometimes it's difficult to discern if it's tinea or some sort of a dermatitis. Um, and you might prescribe the steroid. And of course, if it doesn't work, if it gets worse, then maybe you're like, okay, maybe this is fungal and I need to try an antifungal. Um, systemic therapy. <clears throat> Uh, or systemic side effects with topical therapy. Again, we talked about these last fall, but you have um, hyperglycemic risk and then the pituitary axis suspension, suppression, which can cause 
a decrease in endogenous cortisol production. All right, so that's steroids. I'm going to move into a couple other classes here. Um, topical immune modulators is a couple of drugs we can use for severe atopic dermatitis that work to um, suppress the immune system's local reaction to what's going on. Um, one of the drugs, uh, or two of them, are tacrolimus and pimecrolimus. And you might remember tacrolimus, hopefully you remember this, from uh, the transplant lecture. It's a transplant medication. Um, it also comes topically, and so you really don't have any risk of long term side effects or anything like this of systemic absorption, but it does inhibit T cell lymphocyte activation locally, just like it would if you took it um, for um, immune system suppression for an, as an anti-rejection medication. Um, and people can use this as an alternative to corticosteroids. Um, Imiquimod is a product with brand name Aldera, and it was uh, designed originally to treat um, genital warts, but I actually find that it's useful for some types of skin cancers as well, um, and that's probably where it's more useful. Um, it's kind of a weird drug. You have to apply it like two to five times a week and leave on for six to ten hours, and you have to take it, use it for quite a bit of time, especially if you're looking at genital wart treatment, um, and I think the cancers are quite long courses too, so um, I'm not sure if this is generic. It was quite expensive at one point, but I believe it's now generic. At least um, there's some some formulations of it are probably generic now. It's an odd product to use. I'll, I'll just throw that out there. Psoriasis. Uh, okay, let's talk about our first disease. And we'll talk about psoriasis and acne as far as like examples of diseases that are dermatologic that we can treat um, with drugs. So psoriasis is a really common um, chronic skin disorder. Um, and it affects the cycle of skin cells. So skin cells end up building up rapidly on the surface of the skin. You get these thick kind of, they call it silvery scales. It looks kind of like white dry skin with red patches. Um, and it's itchy. It can be itchy. It can be painful. Some patients might not have those symptoms with the plaques, but for most people, they will. Uh, most people just find this to be a nuisance in the sense that it's not seriously causing them any problems other than the fact that it's not very appealing to look at and it's a bit itchy. So in the grand scheme of things, um, is it a, like a medical emergency? Not usually. Um, however, you can get psoriatic arthritis, which is more like... Um, a rheumatologic, well, this is a rheumatologic condition in general, but it, it has a lot of similar symptoms to rheumato uh, rheuma excuse me, rheumatoid arthritis, which um, is an autoimmune disease uh, attacking joints, and that can actually translate from um, psoriasis too. So that'd be a really severe example of psoriasis um, causing people um, kind of chronic pain type symptoms in their joints. There is no cure for psoriasis. We can only really prevent um, the symptoms from happening. We'll talk about those here in a second. All right, mild to moderate psoriasis uh, and how we treat somebody with a mild uh, disease. So really when it comes to mild to moderate um, versus severe, what you're looking at is a couple different criteria. So mild to moderate patient might have, and it's usually a total amount of body exposure. So if they don't have a lot of plaques, maybe they only have a couple or they're in kind of inconspicuous areas, they just, they're itchy, they're uncomfortable. Um, that would be maybe a mild to moderate patient. The more severe you get, the higher number and body surface area of plaques you have. And um, also, of course, systemic symptoms. Once you get into like psoriatic arthritis, arthritis symptoms, you aren't really going to use topical therapy because topical therapies, you know, it can help with the topical lesions if those are a problem too. Um, so you could use it potentially, but that's not going to be your mainstay of treatment. You're going to try something more systemic that's a much more potent uh, agent. We'll talk about those here in a second. But sticking to mild to moderate here, so again, low body surface area, maybe smaller plaques. Um, Coltar is a product you can buy over the counter. Um, it's kind of messy, but um, you can use it um, to, to almost as like a, a bath product, like in the shower or after the shower. Um, it's not something that works all that well for most people because it's really messy, uh, but it can actually slow rapid growth and restore skin, skin appearance. So this might be somebody who, if a patient who's interested, maybe a quote unquote more uh, natural alternative, this could be an option for them. It actually does have some decent evidence behind it too. It's not, I would say, you know, a, a a slam dunk, but it's it's not a bad option either for somebody who wants to try it. Um, retinoids like vitamin A uh, products are quite popular for psoriasis. So there's a lot of vitamin A, and we haven't talked about vitamin A yet as far as the, the supplements yet, but vitamin A um, has a, a number of clinical applications, and this is one of probably the more prominent ones, and it's basically derivatives of vitamin A used topically um, can modify gene expression and cause anti-inflammatory and anti-proliferative effects locally. 
Um, we can also use this, we'll talk about some vitamin A products that they use for acne that are systemic too. And it's not really vitamin A in the traditional sense, it's not like you can go out and buy vitamin A supplements and take them and get the same effects. It's really a, a retinoid, which is what vitamin A is, and it's more of a modified version of that. So there's um, tazeratine and acetre uh, acetretin, which are, again, both uh, excuse me, tazeratine is a topical product. Um, and um, we didn't talk, again, we haven't talked about vitamin A. Vitamin A's biggest issue is that it's teratogenic at really high doses, um, and especially when you're looking at systemic absorption. So these are drugs that you would not use in people who are pregnant or trying to get pregnant. Um, and acetretin is an oral option. It's also teratogenic. Um, so you could take maybe tazeratine uh, if you're looking at a smaller body surface area, you could try the oral product acetretin if you're looking at more significant um, involvement. Uh, vitamin D analogs are also useful for this, and there's a couple different uh, topical products. Um, Calcipotriene or Dovonex is the brand name. It's a topical product. Um, you can actually use this on the scalp too, which is interesting. So if you had a um, uh, a plaque on on your in, within your hair somewhere, you could use it there. Um, and then Calcitriol, which is again oral active vitamin D that we use in our um, trans or in a, sorry, down to transplant patients, our dialysis patients. Doesn't really have any adverse effects. Um, it's shown to be more effective than like um, non-active vitamin D for whatever reason. You can combine these vitamin A analogs with other medications. Um, so you can combine the vitamin A's with the vitamin D's. You can combine them with like um, tacrolimus or pimecrolimus, and you can also use corticosteroids. The question is how many creams and ointments do you want somebody applying to their lesions? Maybe they use one in the morning and one at night or something like that. So that's probably a more realistic approach than like having them apply a bunch at once. Um, phototherapy is another option for mild to moderate psoriasis, which actually has some um, good proven benefit. The problem is, is that if you're um, like going to a, a tanning booth or something that's designed for this or using phototherapy at home, um, you can end up with a significant risk for skin cancer. So there's a trade-off. Do you want psoriasis or skin cancer? Now, you don't, don't guarantee skin cancer with phototherapy, but it is putting you at risk for it. All right, severe psoriasis, again, more than about 10% of the body affected usually, so big plaques and big areas, which makes topical therapy pretty much um, impossible, either from a compliance standpoint or simply from an efficacy standpoint. Um, so phototherapy works for severe too. UV light does work for this. Again, you have that cancer risk potential. Um, and systemic therapy is what we're looking at here. So got a couple medications and we're going to get, I'm going to gloss over a lot of this because it's going to, we're going to go into more detail in a couple lectures in rheumatoid arthritis. And it's really very similar for treatment, but I will touch base on a couple things. Um, so you have uh, methotrexate, um, your oral retinoids, uh, which are the oral vitamin A products, um, cyclosporin, which you should remember from transplant as an immune suppressant agent and your biologic agents. There's a number of biologic agents out there for um, severe psoriasis, and they also work for um, rheumatoid arthritis. Again, it's a very similar disease. It's autoimmune diseases, and they're suppressed very similar. And we're going to talk about Crohn's disease during GI, and there's a lot of similar treatments there too. So all the autoimmune diseases generally uh, are treated um, fairly similar because you're looking at a broad immune suppressive agent, but you don't want to suppress the immune system to a point where people are getting sick all the time. So that's the big trade-off here. Um, the anti-tumor necrosis factor agents will be discussed during RA, but keep them in mind that they are useful for, for severe psoriasis. Um, insure, they are super expensive, so these are biologic agents, like Humira and Enbrel are the two brand names. You've probably heard of them, maybe. They're, they're always in like the top 10 um, sales uh, yearly for drugs. They're very popular. And... Um, as far as getting them paid for, insurance does cover them depending, like if you can prove that you have psoriatic arthritis, they're probably going to pay for a biologic. Um, and if you can prove that you have, if your doctor can sign something or, or talk to the insurance company and say, yeah, they've got 30% of their body covered with psoriatic plaques, they'll say, okay, well, we'll, we'll pay for that in that point. But we aren't going to pay for, you know, 10%. That's too little. They can use topical for that or use something else. Um, the other oral therapies like methotrexate, just kind of a general immune suppressive agent, we're really, again, looking at suppressing the immune system um, to do this. So much different tactic than the topical things we've just been talking about. Um, there are a couple specific sor uh, psoriatic arthritis agents out there. Uh, ustekinumab or Stolera and Secukinumab uh, or Cosentix are two newer agents. They have specific IL um, interleukin um, suppression activity. 
and um, they they're used for some other things, but they do have some some benefit in studies in psoriatic arthritis. Uh, there's a new drug called uh, Aprilmolast, which is Oltezla as the brand name, and it's a PO medication. Um, which inhibits a specific phosphodiesterase enzyme. And basically that phosphodiesterase is thought to uh, promote the production of inflammatory mediators. Um, so it's a kind of a novel mechanism that hasn't really been explored all that much, but it has been shown to be useful for psoriatic arthritis. Any systemic therapy can be combined with a topical therapy too. So if you're starting somebody who has a lot of plaque psoriasis on a systemic therapy, it's going to take a while for it to work. So giving them something topically to suppress the those lesions potentially and to help um, maybe even relieve some of the, the itching and, and irritation as, uh, associated with them can be very useful in the short term while you're waiting for those drugs to really take, take effect. But Overall, these medications are really highly effective for, um, for psoriasis, so they, they do work quite well, especially like the anti-tumor necrosis factor agents. And again, um, we'll talk about those more during rheumatoid arthritis, so if you want to come back after we talk about RA and kind of match them up and be like, okay, we just talked about TNF agents, let's go back to this lecture, see where they plug in, I, I'd recommend doing that just to give you a more broad approach. You know, if you just remember that um, the biologic agents are the ones that are kind of the end game as far as what we use for more severe cases, you'll, you'll be probably just fine for my exam. But um, we'll talk about what those specifically are during RA. I figured it wasn't worth double covering them per se. And they're so um, important when it comes to the treatment of RA that that's really where they fall into. Psoriatic arthritis is a bit more of a rare condition, I think, as opposed to RA. So... So let's, uh, let's sum up the treatment for uh, psoriasis. So topical corticosteroids, hydrating emollients can work well for mild to moderate. Um, and then you have a whole slew of other things that we can talk about too. So topical retinoids, vitamin D analogs, coltar, the um, tacrolimus, pimecrolimus uh, medications, these all can be used. And um, it, it allows people a number of different options. So if somebody doesn't you know, um, respond well to one, they have another one, they have several others they can switch to. So plenty of topical choices to, to cycle through to see what's going to work best for your patients. I put phototherapy kind of in the middle here. It's something you could recommend for patients if you felt comfortable with it. Again, there is that skin cancer risk there. So the question is, is that something somebody is comfortable with, somebody wants to try? Maybe they, they just really are adamant they want to go outside in the summer a lot and um, try and get the sun exposed to it to, to decrease the psoriasis. And if that's something that they really want to try, I think that, again, there's evidence to support that phototherapy works. There's just that cancer risk. So I'm not sure how comfortable I'd be as a provider recommending somebody do that, uh, but it is something somebody could potentially try on their own. Um, so phototherapy, and there are phototherapy specific things that can, um, I think, are designed for psoriasis, and I, and I don't know for sure, but that min minimize the certain wavelength exposure that can cause um, the skin cancer. But again, a lot of people aren't going to go that route. They're probably going to go to A, a tanning booth, or B, they're going to go outside in the summer and, and tan outside. So it, it's a question of how effective is the actual therapy going to be in the way that somebody in the real world is going to use it. So um, phototherapy, if somebody tries it, doesn't work, or if, you know, they have a really high percentage of skin involved, or they're looking at, um, or you're looking at a, uh, an absolute contraindication. So maybe they have a family history of skin cancer, and they're like, no, I'm absolutely not going to do phototherapy. Or they have arthritic symptoms associated with their psoriasis. You're definitely going to want to move to this final category, which are um, the systemic retinoids like um, acetretin, uh, methotrexate, which we talked about during chemotherapy. We're going to talk about it again during RA, so we'll go through it in more detail then. Um, and cyclosporin, again, if you want to review what cyclosporin is, I'd check the transplant notes um, just to, to refresh your memory. It's just a, a broad immune suppressant agent. Um, and then the biologics, the tumor necrosis factor agent. So again, we'll come back to those during RA. All right, so our second disease state, we'll talk about acne. Uh, acne uh, has a number of different approaches to the tre treatment, and really um, there's a number of different agents you can use that are going to target a variety of symptoms, and it can really just depend on how severe the acne is and how aggressive we're going to treat it. Um, so there's a number of topical acne treatments on the market. Salicylic acid, benzoyl peroxide are both over-the-counter, and they come in a lot of different strengths um, and a lot of different products. So you can find these um, really in a number of different things that are branded as like acne-treating 
um, creams or whatever. Um, benzoyl peroxide for a while was prescription only, but it recently, relatively recently, became over the counter in a number of different strengths. Um, and then you have retinoids, just like we can use for um, psoriasis. It's a very similar process. They're similar products for acne. Uh, they do cause local irritation, so they tend to dry people's skin out quite a bit. They're fairly effective, but um, especially if somebody's out in the sun a lot, they can end up, because of that dry skin, they can end up at higher risk for sunburns. They can end up just with generally kind of dry, sloughing skin because the, these medications more or less are causing the skin, um, the, the ability of the skin cells to differentiate and, and produce and proliferate is suppressed and, cha and altered that can end up causing um, some some strain and some some uh, irritation on the local skin, especially on the face where the skin tends to be thin and a little bit more sensitive. A um, number of products here. The Retin-A products are probably the most popular ones. There's a lot of generic versions of these too. Um, Retin-A is tretinoin and um, uh, there's Retin-A microgel, there's Retin creams, there's a number of different products. So again, if somebody has like a, a gel that they're using, the gels tend to, I think, be more potent as far as being more effective, but they also uh, tend to dry people's skin out more. Uh, you also have products like Differin, which is Adalapine, which is really just a, a similar product. These all fall in the same categories, and you have Tazerotine. I can never say that drug name. Uh, that one is one that um, we talk about for psoriasis. You can use it for acne, too. So all these ones fall in the same category. You wouldn't want to combine any of them, but you could definitely try one of these. It's a pretty, uh, pretty well-proven um, treatment for topical acne, but again, you do get that irritation with it. Oral acne therapy. So this is one most people have probably heard of maybe as Accutane or isotretinoin. Um, this is indicated only for severe cystic acne. It's thought to work by inhibiting sebaceous gland size and function. Um, uh, people will take this usually for four to five months. And after that, if they fail, they could start a tre second treatment course after a two month off interval. Uh, this drug has all sorts of issues with it. Um, major the two biggest ones are going to be uh, psychiatric side effects, which are going to be um, aggression and depression are actually pretty commonly reported with um, Accutane, and birth defects. So if you take Accutane, you have to be part of this I pledge program, um, and you have to show that you have, um, you're have you on forms of contraception. So if you're a female, you have to be on birth control. And you have to be able to prove that you haven't, I, I believe you have to take pregnancy tests at certain intervals while you're on the, the drug. Um, this is a known teratogen. It's a category X medication. So it's not like we're just, you know, doing this out of precaution. This is well, well known to, to be highly teratogenic. Um, and so to prevent birth defects in our general population, we have these systems in place that are risk management strategies. And this is one of them called iPledge. Pharmacies that dispense tretinoin have to be a part of this too and have to make sure a person is enrolled with this before they can prescribe it. So that's, it's on the patient, it's on the prescriber, it's on the pharmacy as well. So there's three different areas where you have to have a lot of paperwork and, and tests and stuff like that done to be on Accutane. For, for male patients, it's a bit easier for obvious reasons. Uh, antibiotics can be used systemically too. Um, this is something that always makes me cringe a little bit because I hate the... I, I just think that it, it scares me because you're. I think the the odds of breeding resistance and and um, yeah, it's just it's 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 a little scary. But uh, anyway, it is indicated. It is useful, and a, and a lot of patients take these, and uh, there is um, quite a bit of efficacy around it. So antibiotics generally you should be targeting a specific bacteria called propi in. Propionibacterium acnes, which is a uh, specific type of bacteria associated with acne lesions. Um, tetracyclines, uh, erythromycin, sulfa drugs like Bactrim, clindamycin, and azithromycin all have activity against these. So these are usually the ones you're going to see. Probably the most common ones people are prescribed are doxycycline, um, maybe Bactrim, sometimes clindamycin too. Topically, you're usually looking at clindamycin uh, products. So uh, I would highly recommend never using clindamycin as a systemic one because it tends to give people pretty bad diarrhea. But um, topically, it, it's a pretty decent uh, option. Okay, so let's talk about treatment of acne and how we're going to really approach somebody with acne. So usually you're looking at first-line therapies for mild treatment, going to be like a topical retinoid uh, or maybe a topical antimicrobial. So or in combination would work well too, especially if you're getting more towards a moderate case. So maybe they're using their retinoid in the morning and their topic in their um, their uh, their uh, topical clindamycin at night, something like that. 
Uh, once you get up to more of a moderate therapy, you're looking at um, some of the more uh, oral therapies, like they add oral antibiotics into the mix, combining them with topical retinoids. BPO is benzoyl peroxide. Uh, and I think I have the, the key on what some of this stuff means on the next slide in case you're curious. Um, you can see here they're also throwing in alternatives like you can use salicylic acid uh, and then they're um, recommending combinations down here with basically combining different topicals. One of the big things that they're adding to this is the oral antibiotic. And you know, personally, while it works, I would be a little bit hesitant to prescribe this or use this for you know people I know. But just because I, I'm a bit on the antimicrobial stewardship um, bus that I think that our society is in a bit of trouble when it comes to antibiotic resistance. And so for things that are more cosmetic in nature, I have a tough time justifying it. I would try pretty much everything else personally before I use an oral antibiotic. However, if you look at um, treatment recommendations, oral antibiotics do kind of fall square in the middle of moderate. Um, and I'm sure you guys probably know or maybe have personally taken them. And it's not like it's a terrible thing to do. It's just for me personally, I, I find it to be a little bit troubling. Um, and I'd rather reserve our um, antibiotics for actual um, more severe infectious diseases so we don't generate resistance in the community. Um, as far as uh, nodular and severe, what you're looking at is moving up to multiple combination therapies or going to an oral isotretinoin. So you can see, like, first of all, here you have oral antibiotic plus topical retinoid and benzoyl peroxide uh, versus oral isotretinoin um, uh, versus kind of those three. So you could maybe add this in even for a more moderate case. In severe cases, you're looking at pretty much going to that or they're recommending going to high dose oral antibiotic, which how well is somebody really going to tolerate that for long term? Um, hormonal therapy is even offered. So this would be more prescribed for, of course, female patients. Um, oral contraceptives, we're going to talk about these specifically, but there are some that have um, that can help um, with acne symptoms that have specifically formulated hormones that don't um, uh, cause acne and actually can prevent it. So there are there is that option for um, female patients as well. Maintenance therapy, generally once you get it under control, so if you do a short course of um, an oral uh, oral isotretinoin like uh, Accutane, then you can give like a topical retinoid plus uh, a benzoyl peroxide treatment maybe as sort of a maintenance therapy. So you're preventing things from recurring as bad as they once were. Uh, Cause somebody can't be on Accutane for life. And, and hopefully once they get into more of an adult adult years, it's going to grow out of it a bit, but over time, they might need something to suppress that in the meantime, because again, four to five months of treatment, and then uh, you're looking at um, being off of it for, for a few months. Again, here's just some stuff about uh, the acronyms and whatever, in case you want to look at it. Uh, again, I talked about this already, but uh, p acnes is growing more and more resistance about to, to our standard therapy. So doxycycline is used a lot. And we're getting more resistance to it. Basically, standard tetracycline used to be the treat one of the drugs of choice orally for antibiotics or acne, and now we've pretty much run into resistance with that. And it's also you have to take it a lot. It's a, frequently it's like a QI, TID to QID dosing. Uh, so people are using doxycycline now. Doxycycline is a pretty broad spectrum antibiotic. Um, so what I'd recommend for people who are considering oral antibiotic therapy, first of all. The widespread use and rotating of antibiotics are pretty much the biggest sources of the problem here. Um, and what we want to do is avoid those two things. So widespread use, meaning don't prescribe these to patients who don't need them, which is, you know, common sense. But let's just say it again. Don't prescribe these to patients that don't need them. This should not be your gut instinct is, oh, let's give them an oral antibiotic. You should pretty much try everything else before you do that, in my opinion. Again, uh, I'm giving you a little bit of a soapbox here, but that's just what I think. So. Um, increased resistance is going to not only cause problems in our community in general um, for our society, but you're lowering your treatment efficacy if you're breeding resistance. Um, we don't really know what the clinical impact is. So a lot of this is theoretical. Um, and we don't really know if we're, you know, if you take doxycycline for acne as a teenager, does that put you at higher risk for resistant infections? No one's really done a study on that. Um, theoretically, yes, it does. But again, no one really knows that. Um, so what is the right way to do? So limit your duration of oral antibiotics to less than 18 weeks. Don't do any, um, don't uh, go any longer than that. Um, I'll, 
allow six to eight weeks at least of therapy before you switch antibiotics. So one of the big problems is people will try doxycycline for a week. It doesn't work then they'd try something else. You have to give these medications time. You have to give the skin time to heal. So you might kill all the bacteria, but the lesions are still there. It's gonna take a while for the skin to be able to regenerate itself and uh, and work work uh, alongside of whatever therapy you're offering. You can, of course, combine benzoyl peroxide is a good combination. It does have some antimicrobial activity as well. So that can help with um, some synergy approach to um, killing the bacteria. It might limit your um, ability to breed resistance if you're using BPO at the same time as an oral antibiotic. And plus topical retinoids do, do a similar thing. Um, so you definitely want to include some topical therapy if you're giving oral um, antibiotics just because, again, you get synergy and you improve efficacy rates. And watch that duration. Don't cycle antibiotics frequently. Give the antibiotics some time to work. Okay, so stepping away from acne here and talking about a couple other random topics to finish up the lecture. Antifungals. Uh, mostly these are over-the-counter products. We have things like ketor uh, ketoconazole, uh, which is nizorol, terbinafine, which is lamisil, uh, clotrimazole, which is lotrimin. Um, there's nystatin, which is a prescription-only product. Um, basically, these are all useful for tinea infections, and um, the first three are over-the-counter products, and you probably recognize the brand names. There's another one, too, that's a different branded Lotrimin, I think, that's kind of like Terbenafine, but it's a newer product. I can't remember what it's called, uh, but it's basically the same thing. They're all topical antifungals. Um, there are some vaginal preparations, too, which are antifungal, too, so for um, uh, vaginal um, candida infections, Myconazole, Clotrimazole, there's a couple other ones, too, that are formulated that way as well. Um, antibiotics, we talked a little bit about topical antibiotics during that lecture, so I'm not going to revisit that. Um, antivirals, mentioned this again briefly. Um, acyclovir uh, is available as an ointment or a cream for as Zovirax for uh, topical um, herpes type uh, lesions. There's another product called Silva, Silver Sulfadiazine, or Silvadine is the brand name, or SSD. Um, if you work in an area, like if you go to Hennepin, work at Hennepin County where they have a burn unit and you happen to work in that area, you're going to be pretty familiar with this product. It's really not used outside of, outside of really severe burn victims. And what it does is it's a really broad spectrum antibacterial and antifungal. Silver as a metal is antibacterial and antimicrobial. Um, and it actually has effects against things even including pseudomonas. So you get uh, a pretty decent uh, broad spectrum coverage with this. It also provides a barrier while that skin is healing. So they use this quite a bit in uh, patients who have Stevens-Johnson syndrome or have undergone burns from a, a fire or something. Uh, destructive agents, I uh, mentioned salicylic acid briefly for acne. Um, in low percentages, it's used. So usually what you see in over-the-counter products is like 2%. You can get some things up to like 6% through a prescription. Um, you can also use salicylic acid in really high concentrations for um, common skin warts. So if you see like Dr. Scholl's products or whatever, you know, is marketed for planter's warts, or um, sometimes they come in just little vials and they're just kind of like a little paste or um, uh, it's almost it's like a little thing of nail polish that you're putting on. It's really high percentage of salicylic acid and it is a carat keratolytic agent or and it will destroy skin cells. Um, so it works for warts. Just be careful where else you're applying it. Um, it is over the counter for a lot of people. So people are going to be um, medicating themselves, which may be a little bit dangerous. So uh, they could end up with irritation depending on if they get exposed to it in more areas than just on the ward. So there's a lot of specific instructions for these medications, but just FYI. Um, urea is something that comes in a number of uh, topical creams and lotions. It's basically a, a more advanced moisturizer. So for people with really dry skin, it uh, it can penetrate a little bit better and cause a little. So it's more of a, I guess it's a, basically it's a lotion on steroids without actually having steroids in it, right? If that makes sense. Um, it can cause um, uh, keratolytic effects in uh, prolonged use too. So you might end up with some skin sloughing and breakdown over time. Um, they do use this in really high concentrations too, sometimes for skin cancer treatment. Fluorouracil is an anti-metabolite um, that's injected into different uh, rapidly proliferating, or applied topically, excuse me, to rapidly proliferating cells. So for skin cancer, this is some type of option we see patients using sometimes. Uh, okay, antipyritic agents, 
uh, itch, anti-itch agents, so topical Benadryl, diphenhydramine is in local antihistamine effects, hydrocortisone, low potency corticosteroid, preparation H used primarily for hemorrhoids. There's a lot of different preparations of this. Uh, most of them have phenylephrine in it, which is a vasoconstrictive agent, um, or witch hazel, or shark liver oil. Why exactly they formulate it that way, I don't know. It's kind of one of those old school things from you know, the, the, the previous days of medicine that's made its way into um, common use. And actually, a witch hazel is a topical vasoconstrictor. The shark liver oil, I'm not so sure what exactly the point of that is. Um, topical anesthetics. So I'm not going to spend a ton of time on these, even though if you ever go into procedural areas or if you work in surgery, you're going to get really familiar with these. So um, basically, they're all pretty much the same. They have some different applications, though. So they're all going to be the things that end in cane. Um, lidocaine being the most popular formulation, most popular drug. So there's a ton of creams, um, gels with the, let's spell gel right here. There. Uh, topical solutions, local injections uh, are all very common. So what we see lidocaine used for is infiltration in areas and um, maybe nerve blocks and certain certain things. Um, what they'll do is uh, a really common application for lidocaine is just to infiltrate around a wound before you do a laceration repair if you're going to stitch up somebody. Um, you can combine, lidocaine is often combined with epinephrine too, and epinephrine provides that local vasoconstrictive effect so you get less bleeding and also, and then the lidocaine is numbing the area. What lidocaines and what these anesthetics are doing, they're blocking initiation and conduction of nerve impulses uh, by decreasing sodium ion permeability. This basically prevents um, uh, depolarization from occurring for a bit, so you get a numbing effect. Um, same thing when you get, you heard of Novocaine at the dentist, right? That's the same type of thing. It's a local anesthetic agent. Um, Benzocaine is another product that actually you can find uh, over the counter. Products like Orogel contain Benzocaine. Um, it's used for dental pain. Now, um, we actually, and within our Alina system, we pulled all Benzocaine products. There's a really rare risk of getting met hemoglobinemia, which basically is a very uncommon um, side effect that would cause, and I should, by uncommon, I mean extremely rare, um, side effect that prevents your hemoglobin from binding oxygen like it should, and it can be fatal potentially or can cause lasting uh, issues with it. So we took them off the market because basically the canes all kind of worked the same. We didn't think benzocaine really had any advantages. It came in this stuff called hurricane spray, which was um, kind of an aerosol can that people like to use for ENT applications because you could spray it really easily in like the back of somebody's throat or in their um, nasal mucosa and numb the area locally. So what we use is a lidocaine product that just comes as a little spray bottle and it's basically the same type of a thing. Um, if there's a number of other ones. There's chloroprocaine, there's um, bupivacaine. We'll talk about bupivacaine and ropivacaine when we talk about epidurals during um, OB. Um, but there's a number of different products here. So again, depending on what type of surgery, if you go into procedural uh, medicine like surgery, you're going to use a lot of these products and it just really depends on what you end up doing and what you end up using. All right, fun fun slide for the day. We've got minoxidil, which is like actually Rogaine. Um, uh, this is an over-the-counter product that you can apply twice, twice daily. Um, uh, people should try it up to four months before um, kind of deciding whether it's going to work or not. It does stimulate hair growth. Uh, what it does is it causes vasodilation and increases blood flow and stimulation of resting hair follicles. Um, it's not a permanent effect, so um, after you've applied for four months, if you aren't getting any use, you can stop. If you are getting, if you are getting um, effects from it, you do have to continue using it on a semi-regular basis, unfortunately. Um, the efficacy is highly variable. It tends to work um, much better in men who are thinning hair versus men who have lost large portions of their hair. If you're totally bald, probably out of luck with Rogaine. If you have kind of thin, starting to thin hair, it might be worth a shot. Um, depending on how much extra maintenance you want and how much you want to be applying Rogaine for the rest of your life. Um, interestingly enough, it is a vasodilator, so people who overdo it on Rogaine and apply a lot, maybe they they think that if they use it, oh, I'm going to use it, you know, tons of it four times a day, they might end up with some systemic absorption, which can cause vasodilation and also can put people at risk for hypotension. So that's Rogaine, in case you're curious. Uh, pain management, we'll talk a little bit about topical options during the pain lecture. Um, there are some things that we can apply. 
that are prescription, uh, like lidocaine patches and some prescription NSAIDs, which we'll talk about again during pain. But what I want to talk about right now is um, sore muscles. So there's Bengay and Icy Hot, which are products that cause a heating and cooling sensation. So methyl salicylate and menthol are the drugs in here. Um, be car careful in pregnancy. Salicylates are contraindicated in children in pregnancy. Um, and people can apply too much of this and end up causing a bit of a chemical burn sensation. So it's not always the greatest product, especially if people have sensitive skin. Um, Menfor or Sarna is a camphor menthol lotion product uh, that's a really popular um, product for people who have really dry, itchy skin. Like if it there have really problematic um, dry skin, like during the winter months and they're really itchy, uh, this is a product that's a really popular one for people to do. Um, it does, the camphor um, can have some issues with children potentially. The reason is, is that if somebody consumes it, it can be potentially toxic. So it's okay to use, but just don't eat it basically. And finally, sunscreen. Can't not talk about sunscreen a little bit. So compounds, uh, sunscreens are compounds that absorb UV light. Uh, so there's a couple different categories of compounds. There's basic. So if you see like para-aminobenzoic acid, that's a basic sunscreen. Broad spectrum sunscreens are going to contain products called benzophones. Uh, oxybenzone, anything ends on benzone is going to be a benzophone. Um, what else, other ones uh, I don't have on here? Zinc oxide I've seen in some sunscreens too as a broad spectrum one. Uh, it really just depends. They, they, they all work pretty much the same. What they're going to do is absorb UV, UV light and, uh, and prevent it from getting to your skin. So um, B versus A light is kind of the big question here and what we're absorbing. So UVB light is mostly associated with sunburn um, and less associated with premature aging and cancer. However, it can have those effects. UVA is less associated with sunburn and more associated with aging um, and, and causing cancer. So they, they can both cause cancer and aging, but the UVB light is what's going to be more associated with sun, sunburn. So what you would have in the past potentially is sunscreens that really only protect against UVB. So they prevent you from getting sunburned, but they might not prevent those UVA rays uh, uh, from um, causing the advanced aging signs of skin and also putting at higher risk for cancer. So when it comes to SPF, what does that mean when you're buying a sunscreen? Well, it's effectiveness at absorbing erythrogenic UV light. And erythrogenic meaning ability to cause sunburn, essentially. So um, what they've determined, what the FDA has determined as far as SPF goes, is that uh, there's a couple things. First of all, you need SPF more than 15 to be proven as a broad spectrum sunscreen. That's what they recommend people use. Um, broad spectrum means also that your compounds in the sunscreen have to be able to absorb A and B. They can't just absorb one. Um, less than 15 uh, SPF, you can't put any claims on your label that you prevent skin cancer or early aging. So really you can only prevent sunburn basically is what you're saying if you're less than 15. If you're over 15, then you could put those claims on your label. Um, a lot of sunscreens were, uh, oh, the, the FDA cracked down on a couple things a little while ago. They basically told people that if you put, uh, you can't put greater than 50 SPF on your um, sunscreen because it just doesn't matter. Once you get above that, there's no difference between a 50 and a 75 or even a 100 SPF, some of the ridiculous things you're seeing out there. And also they cracked down on sunscreens uh, advertising as waterproof because, I mean, really it's, it, Common sense would tell you that sunscreens can't be waterproof, hopefully, because it's it's lotion. <laughs> lotion is water soluble by definition. Uh, it has water content, so it's going to wash off in the water. Um, as soon as basically you go swimming after you've applied your sunscreen, you have to reapply it. Um, if you don't, you're you're you're, on a, you're exposed to the sun without anything. Um, the waterproof crackdown came because people were the, these companies were advertising theirs as heavily water water sweat proof. All this stuff it's just not possible to do that. Um, so you do have to apply the sunscreen regularly if you're sweating or in the water, which is most cases most of us when we're in a situation where we're applying sunscreen. So that's one of the things the FDA finally put a uh, stop to. Um, sunscreens are of course over the counter. Um, there's a ton of different products out there, and uh, and just remember that the broad spectrum means that it, if it's labeling itself as broad spectrum, it has A and B uh, activity, and it's greater than SPF 15. All right, so that's a dermatology in a nutshell from my perspective. Uh, hopefully you learned something, and uh, I'll be posting this, um, this and the um, bone mineral lecture, and then we'll meet in class again, or meet in class uh, on Monday to discuss pain management.